Thank you, Chairman Smith, and thank you for holding this hearing, really addressing an incredibly important issue of gender inequity, not just in India, but certainly gender inequity throughout the, the world. And I look at this issue not just as a member of Congress, I look at this issue as a, as a doctor, but also, you know, the focus of this hearing is India, and I look at this issue as an Indian American. But the most important title I hold today is being the father of a daughter. And on that day where It's a Girl was, um, w was um, told to us by, by our doctor, that was an incredibly joyous day. When my wife and I think about how we're raising our daughter, we're raising her to be a strong woman. We're raising her to be in full control of her body and her choices. We're raising her to stand up against discrimination and not succumb to discrimination. And it's not enough that we're raising our daughter that way, but it is an imperative that every girl and every um, woman on this planet is empowered that same way. And at its core, that is the, the purpose of why this is such a critical issue. Um, sun, sun preference and sex selection really are products of this gender discrimination. And to address them, we really have to deal with the underlying causes of bias against women and girls. And these are incredibly complex issues. Um, you know, there's a complex web of socioeconomic and cultural factors that result in discrimination against girls. You know, the chairman, um, identified a few of those. You know, these then manifest in sex selective practices, so we have to address those underlying causes. The only way to achieve long-lasting and real change is really to engage in community-level campaigns, to change attitudes and change cultural norms that perpetuate this bias against women and girls. You know, other manifestations of gender discrimination um, are you know, the abhorrent rates of sexual violence that occur child marriage, domestic violence, honor killings, the denial of basic health care, including basic family planning and maternal health services. You know, I just had the chance to, to visit India recently, and you know, there are grassroots efforts, and there are some very strong Indian women that are addressing this issue at the root cause, and we'll, we'll hear from some of these, these strong women today and, and our witnesses. But when I was in, recently in Mumbai, I had the opportunity to visit a group called Sneha that was started by women doctors in India. The whole point was that they saw far too much gender discrimination. They saw far too much violence against girls in India. And they would go into the slums and start working with these girls to build up their self-esteem, to build up their strength. But they didn't just work with the girls. They also worked with the young men to change their attitudes, these boys, to make sure that they understood um, that women were equal to them. And they grew up as boys into men with an understanding of this gender equity. So it's incredibly important that we empower organizations like this that are homegrown organizations that are working um, at the grassroots level with girls to, to empower individuals. The best role for the U.S. to play is to remain a strong supporter and leader within the global community in order to best promote women's rights and the freedom of every woman to make personal decisions about her health, her body, and her future, to really empower women. The U.S. is a global leader in providing investment in the health and rights of women and glo girls globally. USAID's family planning programs support healthy timing and spacing of pregnancies. Community-based approaches, contraceptive security, and integration with HIV and maternal and child health programs. The best way to empower a person and to prevent um, sex selection is actually to empower someone to plan when they're ready to start a family, to empower someone to plan when they're ready to get pregnant. That is um, just basic logic, and that is the best way to prevent sex-selective abortions. You know, more than 222 million women around the world want to delay or prevent pregnancy, but they don't have access to um, basic contraception. In 2012, nearly 300,000 women died because of complications due to pregnancy and childbirth. Fully meeting the needs of contraceptive access and effective birth spacing would annually prevent 1.8 million deaths of children under five. It's 25% of all child deaths. 
we can do better than this, and we have the tools um, and the methodology to help reduce this. I also want to make clear, when talking about women's human rights, including reproductive rights, coercion of any kind is unacceptable in the provision of health care, and international leaders should oppose any human rights abuses by working to promote women's health and rights globally. Women everywhere should have the right to determine if, when, and how often they have children. Likewise, all women deserve quality health care during and following pregnancy for both themselves and their families. And as a physician, I know that when women have equal access to quality health care, they lead a more empowered and fulfilling life. While the goal is to mitigate gender discrimination and move towards equitable women's human rights, it must be done so in a way that maintains her rights to make any reproductive health decisions that she deems appropriate for herself and her family. Finally, I'd like to submit for the record an article written by Sneha Bharat of the Guttenmacher Institute regarding sun preference and self-selective abortion bans. Thank you very much, Dr.